Morning, welcome to the 24th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from Claudia Beamish and John Scott and Morris Golden is attending the meeting as the Conservative substitute. Um, he doesn't have to declare any interest as he did that previously whilst a member of the committee. Um, before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items four, five and six in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The second item of business today is to hear evidence from the Crown Estate Scotland. Can I welcome Amanda Bryan, the Chair, uh, Ronnie Quinn, the Chief Executive, and Andrew Wells, Head of Property. Uh, members, as you might imagine, have a series of questions for you, and we'll move straight to questions. Uh, Morris Golden. Uh, welcome. Uh, I wonder if you could outline uh, to what extent there's been a smooth transfer of responsibility. Thanks very much. Um, we're delighted uh, to be here. Um, I think it's really important that we uh, we have the opportunity to come and speak to you. Um, obviously, new organisation really embedded in Scotland with decisions taken in Scotland and the benefits from the assets really being managed um, for the benefit of, of, of communities, stakeholders, local authorities and others. So, so really pleased uh, to be here. Um, as you've recognised, we've just been through a period of uh, transition. Um, I think, personally, uh, coming into it, uh, it it's, it's been a relatively smooth transition. Uh, I have to say the Crown Estate uh, put in a huge amount of effort into ensuring that all of the systems uh, were in place in order to facilitate that uh, transition. And um, obviously it's taken us a little bit of time. Um, it took until the, the start of May to get a new board in place, but we've now had uh, three board meetings and uh, we're, we're moving to, uh, to develop a new corporate plan, uh, which I'm sure we'll touch on um, you know, during the, these proceedings. So I think we're now getting um, all of the different uh, tools in place uh, to make sure that we can manage the assets effectively in this interim period, uh, which is what we've been charged with. Thanks. Um to what extent, and I appreciate you're a relatively small organisation, but what plans do you have in place to ensure you have the right uh, controls in with respect to your uh, uh, internal and external procedures? And do you have any plans to uh, enhance um, your uh, internal and external audit function? All oh, right, OK. Um, I'll ask Ronnie to, uh, to say a little bit more about this, but um, obviously, as, as a board, um, we've, we've really been looking at, at governance and all of the, the, uh, the processes that we need uh, to have in place to ensure that we are managing the assets. Effectively, we obviously have uh, an audit and risk committee in place, and we've also established an investment committee because we think that's going to be a key, uh, a key issue for us going forward is, is how we manage investment. Uh, in terms of... Uh, both internal and external audit. I'll ask Ronnie to say a few words. Thank you, Amanda. Um, quite uh, simple, to be honest. Last year, we, we staffed up to, to ensure that we had a, a finance team. We're augmenting that or, uh, next week, in fact. Uh, so that'll bring the, the finance team up, up to a total of three. We took the view that it's actually too small of an organisation to have a full-time internal audit uh, function. Uh, however, we've got arrangements in place for external audit um, and the, the processes, etc., were shared with the Scottish Government prior to the, to the transfer. Thanks. Uh, in terms of staff morale, do you, um, I wonder if you could comment on that and say what uh, procedures you have in place either to measure that uh, uh, throughout, whether it's Again, appreciate uh, your size, but you know, 360 degree feedback or or or, or other uh, appraisal processes that might allow you to track that over time. Um, the last all staff survey we did was in December last year. We would normally do them on an annual mm -hmm. basis. In December last year, we had high 80s, uh, a great place to work. High 80 percent, great place to work. Um, there were. 
uh, a couple of areas that we were working on, and that's that we're working through that just now. Um, we we take the time once a quarter to have a, a full uh, half day session with everyone, uh, and that that's a really useful way of testing the temperature and, and how things are. Um, I think, as much as anything, we haven't seen a huge uh, departure of s staff from the, from the um, the office, which is, I suppose, as good an indicator as any. We've, we've had the sort of normal turnover you'd expect, but no no great exodus. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I'm interested to hear about engagement with communities, and uh, in terms of practical measures that you've engaged with to involve communities and how is that how is that been undertaken okay um i'm going to ask um andy to say a little bit specifically about some of the work that's been going on at glenlivet but i'll talk more more broadly um about what we've been doing um i and the rest of the board have been very keen that we get out and we are engaging across the piece with communities and with wider stakeholder groups and indeed uh, with local authorities as, as key stakeholders. Um, personally, I've had um, a range of uh, meetings with, uh, with different uh, organisations, including Community Land Scotland um, and uh, many, of our, uh, tenant, uh, many of our tenants and uh, tenant representative groups. So been getting out there and doing a lot of that. Um, the board has committed to having uh, board meetings out uh, around Scotland, so at least 50% of our board meetings will take place um, out, with, uh, out with Edinburgh. So we've already had meetings in Argyle and, with, uh, and in Shetland, and as part of that we've been looking to engage with a wide range um, of, different, of different groups, including uh, community organisations. One of the things that we're looking at going forward is how we how we carry on with that engagement um, and uh, we're in the process of commissioning uh, two pieces of research um, one focusing on our tenants uh, to get some feedback from our tenants in terms of how they feel we've been doing um, and whether there are any areas to be improved and the other piece of research is around uh, wider stakeholders so uh, through that we'll be engaging with a, a range of different uh, both sectoral groups but also community organizations uh, to get a sense of again how we've been doing where we can improve and how we should be engaging um, with these different groups of people going forward yeah in terms of um sort of operational management across the, the sort of four rural estates on, on the coastal estates we have quite a sort of range of different engagement activities taking place with our directly with our staff or with our managing agent teams on Glenlivet, we've had a, a long established um, very close working relationship with, um, with 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 the community there we've worked um with the Tom and Town and Glenlivet Development Trust and the Cairngorms National Park, for example, on um, uh, the Heritage Lottery funded landscape partnership project, which is very much now moving towards its sort of delivery phase. So that's been a very close working relationship. We've had a sort of formal arrangement through a liaison group with the community there for, for, for many years and, that, and still continue to build on that. Um, other examples, uh, we've worked with Rosewell Development Trust on the Whitehill Estate um, in south of Edinburgh. We've got our managed agents, marine officers, who work within Bidwells, who do a huge amount of work on the West Coast, liaising with, with various community groups, working with mooring associations and other community groups um, in, in both a formal and an informal way. So it's something, as Amanda says, that we're very keen to continue to build on, to look at how we're doing it, where we could do it better, uh, and start to sort of build that more formally into the, the new business. Okay. Uh, just another quick question. Um, the board membership, um, does that help support the engagement of the communities and like different members will take a lead in engaging certain communities? Yeah, I mean, what we've done is because uh, the board members have a range of different backgrounds, we've identified different aspects of the business where they'll take more of a role. And certainly the expectation is that uh, the board members will will engage uh, widely with different stakeholders and uh, within within that within that sector and work to support staff in doing that. That's certainly very much uh, the expectation. Okay, thank you. If, if you've identified any um, 
shortfall in that range of expertise on the board? Are there any areas of the Crown Estate's operation where you maybe don't have that at board level? Um, I think it's early days at this stage, but it's certainly something that um, I have committed to keep a watching brief on. We have the, the scope to have up to eight board members, um, and, and we currently have uh, eight board members plus myself, and at the moment we have six plus myself, so we have two appointments in hand, so that if we identify that we do have a gap, um, that we could actually go out and, and appoint additional uh, members, but we obviously have to be cognisant that it's an interim body, so we would need to know what might be following on before we, we took any, any uh, steps in that direction. I'm thinking specifically around farming, because you'll be aware that there has been a concern voice that, uh, from that element of the Crown Estate um, that an understanding of the needs of the farming part of, of the estate uh, needs to be there and they want to hear, have their voice heard. Are you satisfied that at board level that, that is the case? Um, I think that while we don't necessarily have a farmer on the board, we have, um, I think there's three of us that have considerable land management experience um, on the board and are actually relatively well connected um, with the farming community. So, um, so I don't see that at this point in time as a specific shortcoming. Um, and we're certainly looking to engage. I've, I've been involved in meetings with Scottish Tenant Farmers Association, with NFUS. We have another meeting with NFUS um, Tenants Working Group coming up. And we're also uh, meeting with the likes of Henry Graham, who is dealing, um, he's, um, you know, one of the, the um, uh, one of the agricultural uh, champions. Um, and and really, you know, he's keen to explore with us how we look at, um, I guess, opportunities for for introducing new entrants um, into farming. Sounds like you're on top of it. That's good. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, can I move us on to a discussion about the Islands Bill? Uh, perhaps to declare an interest as a Highlands and Islands MSP, I've got a great interest in that. Okay. I'm very keen to see. Uh, the philosophy of trying that islands are future realised in practice. Could you give us um, a progress report about the setting up of the pilot scheme for the management of assets in relation to Orkney Shetland and the Western Isles? Okay. Um, so we've been asked by Scottish Government to look at uh, developing um, a number of pilots, uh, not just in relation to the islands or local authorities, but actually in relation to communities as well. So. Um, so we're looking at how we do that because whatever we put in place needs to be uh, done in a consistent, um, fair and equitable way. Um, so the first thing that we're doing is we are looking at the proposal that has been put on the table uh, by the island's authorities. Um, to date, we ha had a session at our Shetland board meeting with the three island's authorities. I think that was a very productive and, uh, and helpful meeting um, and it helped the board as a whole understand where the islands were coming from and what they were hoping to achieve through the pilots. Um, and subsequent to that, um, some uh, of the officials from the three islands authorities have been in and met with the team um, in the office, again, to understand um, some of the, the practicalities in terms of how the, the assets are currently managed. Um, we appreciate that this isn't something that's going to happen um, overnight, but we do want to uh, proceed with a degree of, of, uh, of pace. And in order to, to help this process, we're looking to appoint uh, two fixed term appointments um, to, uh, to develop um, a pilot's uh, scheme. Um, so that's where we're at at the moment. Thank you for that. There is obviously a danger that in any organisation things drift, and I accept, um, obviously, that the um, that you want to see these pilot schemes happen. Would you say that the, the pace um, and the speed that you have in your corporate head is the same as Orkney, Shetland and Western Isles? Oh, I, I don't think I've specifically asked them that, that question, um, but the impression that I got when we met was that they were happy to have had that conversation and they were um, delighted um, to, to be having the open discussion with us um, so if you come back in a year's time, we would have a pilot scheme? I would, I would hope that, uh, that we would have made good progress uh, towards um, a pilot scheme of some kind. 
Can we move on to another area that is still relevant to this? And this is the decentralisation of jobs and functions. You know, in the history of Parliament, there's been some debate about that. And the philosophy, which I don't need to give any lectures to anyone today, is that all Scotland pays for public sector jobs, so all Scotland should benefit. And I think in the second session of Parliament, um, there was a major move with the relocation of s &H, um, from Edinburgh to Inverness, which I have a certain interest in, in that I live in that particular patch. Um, how realistic is serious job location from Edinburgh to Orkney, Shetland and Western Isles? This, at the moment, we're an interim body um, and as far as I'm aware, there are no intentions for, um, for, for moving uh, staff. Um, but it's important to note that there's actually quite a lot of, uh, you know, quite a few staff actually based out with Edinburgh. There's obviously a team at uh, Glenlivet and uh, and the new um, we've got a forester who is uh, just starting at Glenlivet. There's a team at Fockabers, um, and also um, the managing agents um, model that we use actually has staff based around Scotland. So so there's actually quite a lot of employment in in rural areas already. It's maybe a question for Ronnie Quinn, but how many staff do you currently have in Edinburgh, and how many would you expect to have? over the next couple of years. Is it going to be stable there or are you going to see any growth in numbers? Uh, in Edinburgh just now we're um, mid, mid to high 20s. So it's not, it's not a significantly large organisation going forward. That will largely depend on what comes our way. That, that staff complement will, will take us through business as usual. If there are further project works Amanda's already mentioned the islands and um, uh, local management, then we'll, we'll need to resource up to, to staff those. But you take my point that it is within the philosophy of the Islands Bill, which is going to our sister committee, as you, as you know currently, and our Islands for Future to relocate jobs. But presumably it's within your competence as a board to decide to relocate to islands. I suppose <coughs> on the technical point, there's nothing stopping you relocating jobs if you wish to do so. On the technical point, no, there isn't. Right. And have, ha have you had any indication from government this would be a positive move? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, and I think I would, I would um, echo Amanda's earlier point that this is an interim organisation that's been set up. We don't know yet the shape of the legislation that will be introduced during, the, during this parliament. And um, I think it would be uh, perhaps premature to, to reform too quickly in advance of that, that legislation coming in. Hmm. And finally, Convener, if you are setting up you know, pilot schemes in Orkney, Shetland and Western Isles, um, it, it may be a, an advantage to have staff within the islands. I take, it you have, I take the point you have staff in other parts of Scotland, but do you have any other staff decentralised within Orkney, Shetland or Western Isles currently? No, we don't. Um, and I think that's something that we'll need to bear in mind when we're modelling uh, and looking at what the potential for uh, a local management arrangement for the islands are, as to whether or not um, having staff based there would be uh, appropriate or not. So philosophically, within the islands bill and, and managerially, it might make some sense to have some staff in the three island groups I mentioned? It would depend entirely on the, the pilot or the shape of the pilot as to whether or not that would make sense or not. And it, it wouldn't be fair for me to, to second judge that at this stage. OK, thank you, Kavira. There have been several references already this morning to the fact that you're an interim board and you've indicated that you perhaps feel constrained in redeploying jobs whilst you're in that position. Um, are there any other areas of operation where you feel constrained? Because there, there might be a sense that you're marking time at the moment until the permanent arrangement's in place. Um, I wouldn't say that we feel constrained uh, by that at all. Um, I think um, you know we've we've got a clear remit uh, to manage the assets in this in this period. Um, I think um, what we've been able to do is to take a bit of a steer from what we have seen so far coming out of the consultation um, about the new legislative arrangements, and we are, as you are, expecting uh, to see a, a bill introduced um, in this in this year. So I think 
um, what we're looking to do is to evolve um, over that period to make sure that we're not moving counter um, to, to anything that's uh, going to be put in place. But we do have to be mindful that we've been charged with maintaining these assets in good health such that any future uh, management arrangements um, are being implemented in, you know, I guess from the, from the best uh, position. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Donald Cameron. Um, very much in line with my fellow Highlands and Islands MSP, David Stewart. Um, I think it's worth us all reminding ourselves that the Smith Commission and the Scotland Act 2016 explicitly agreed that there would be further devolution of management to um, local authority areas, including the islands. Um, can I just ask around the pilot scheme? Firstly, how quickly do you envisage advising the island authorities um, of the criteria against which the pilots will be assessed? One of the things that we're looking at is, is making sure that whatever criteria are put in place, that the same criteria that we would use uh, to assess any proposals would be exactly the same for any, any community or other local authorities coming forward, um, not just the island. So it's essential that we make sure, as I say, that they are robust and that they are consistent. Um, so that, I think, is the overarching uh, priority. The key thing uh, from our perspective, you've heard from Ronnie already, that we've got a relatively small team um, who are already um, having to, to, uh, to manage the assets on a day-to-day -day basis. So I would like to, to think it would be as soon as we can get um, a dedicated uh, resource in place and we are taking steps already um, to, to put that in place. So I'm not going to say it's tomorrow, but um, I'm, I'm not going to say it's next year. I would hope that it would be sometime in the next couple of months. Okay. Um, uh, it's a very interesting answer because um, on, on one view, different local authorities will have different ideas clearly about how best to, to use it. So for instance, in the Western Isles, which um, I, I, I was in Stornoway last month, um, they may have an idea of working more, collaborati more collaboratively with community landowners, for example. Um, how do you ensure that um, the pilot programme is responsive to, to local needs? Um, I think the models, I, th I, I suspect that there are myriad uh, models out there. So what we have to do is ensure that the, um, uh, you know, the criteria isn't about the exact detail of, of the model, but it's about will it um, ensure that the assets continue uh, to be managed uh, in, in a, I guess, in, in, a, in a positive way? And can we, um, as uh, Crown Estate Scotland, meet our obligations uh, to Scottish ministers um, in, in relation to um, the financial systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And uh, I mean, Ronnie's already done some thinking on this, so um, so perhaps, Ronnie, you might want to, uh, to, to just share some of your thoughts. Yes, I mean, I, I would agree that there are some differences um, in the way that the, the islands in particular would like to move forward. And that's actually only become apparent within the last couple of weeks, truth be told. Um, and, uh, you know, just echoing what Amanda says, I, I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all, but I think um, in, in formulating the way ahead, we need to be at least consistent uh, in how we do this. And I think it's also fair to say there, there was a recognition amongst um, all those round the table that it was, um, while uh, proceeding with some degree of alacrity was important, the, the really important thing and the priority was to get it right first time uh, and to get something that, that would work uh, across the board. And um, I think that that was a, a very useful sentiment to take away. Thank you. Richard Lyle. Yes, good morning. Um, you're quite a new organisation, so basically you have to fit in with other organisations that already are on board. Um, I'd be interested to know how your relationship is with the Scottish Land Commission. Her Majesty's Treasury and with Marine Scotland. I've got other questions after that. OK, um, I'll take um, the first and the third, and, uh, and I'll pass to Ronnie for the second. Um, 
Scottish Land Commission, um, I personally have had meetings with both Andrew Thin as the chair and Bob McIntosh as tenant farming commissioner. Um, they've been very positive uh, meetings, really looking at how, um, how we can engage um, with their agenda. Um, and particularly important on the tenant farming uh, side of things. So, um, and we expect that that relationship to uh, to be ongoing, uh, recognising the um, the work uh, that they are doing in terms of um, reviewing the role of agents, for example. Um, so, we're looking at engaging uh, with them on that. In relation to Marine Scotland, we have um, we have. Um, um, I guess I would say that we've got a very positive uh, working relationship with Marine Scotland, which is um, really set out in the framework document, uh, which sets out what our role is, what Marine Scotland's role as our sponsor uh, department is, and uh, and what Scottish Minister's, uh, what our Cabinet Secretary's role is. And that's very much uh, the way in which we've been working. Um, and it's on the basis, I think, of, uh, of no surprises. I think Andy wants to say something. Yes, I would just want to add in relation to the Land Commission. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually meeting with Hamish Trench, their chief executive, next week. We're starting to look at how we can assist with the work that they're doing. Um, one of the initiatives that we, we have already um, done was to sort of contact all our farming tenants to advise them of the new um, amnesty for farm improvements. Uh, and so we're very keen to sort of work proactively with, with the Land Commission to see how we can assist their work. Yes, uh, before we go on to that, if I, if I just confirm uh, and endorse what Amanda was saying with regards to Marine Scotland, we've had a, a close, not even before transition, we've had a close working relationship with Marine Scotland, particularly around things like aquaculture and, and um, offshore energy, and that's continuing uh, at least on a weekly basis. Uh, there are, uh, ongoing meetings. With, Her Ma with regards to Her Majesty's Treasury, I have to say there, there's no special relationship there. Um, uh, we, we had to go through the, the process of registering for VAT and, and uh, opting various properties for VAT, so uh, we're the same as any other business as far as HM Treasury is concerned. Right. So Crown Estates Scotland, and you've got Crown Estates UK, what relationship do you have with them? And are you autonomous, or do they still have any hold over you, as in directions? A great deal of money, uh, time and effort was spent in making us autonomous. So, as at the, um, the transfer, uh, physically, the cables were pulled out of the connections into the London organisation. Uh, there's no direct... Uh, uh, oversight of Crown Estate Scotland's activities by the Crown Estate based in London. Uh, we have entered into an MOU where we will have uh, two annual uh, meetings to coordinate on things like uh, joint joint projects uh, and you know I've evidenced things like the offshore uh, renewables joint industry project, things like that. Um, this particular year, it was focused on uh, the numbers from last year going into uh, the, the, the Crown State's annual, annual report, um, but it, it's fairly high level and there is no uh, interference, there's no line of control, if you like, between London and uh, Crown State Scotland. Right, some people may not like my next question, but I'm going to ask anyway. Um, Crown State Scotland, in the statement you, you started off, you missed out one important factor. You manage the estates on behalf of the, the monarch. The monarch uh, remains the legal owner. Can I refer to it as a royalist, before anyone uh, questions my, my, uh, the reason I'm asking it? Responsibility for financing the sovereign grant will need to be re reflect the revised settlement of the Crown Estate. Which part do you play in the settlement of the sovereign grant? None. Um, we remit our revenues to uh, the Consolidated Fund at Holyrood. It's a matter for uh, Parliament and Government as to what they do with those revenues. Thank you. Emily Carson. Thanks, Convener. Good morning. It, it's, a, it's probably it, it's a definition as well, so it's maybe appropriate to ask this question at this time. Uh, the Scotland Act 2016 indicates that assets should be held as an estate 
in uh, perpetuity. What does that actually mean? Um, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> in estate and land, so uh, we there are quite a number of um, challenges to managing this. So, for example, we don't own shares in companies. We can't make the, the classic investments uh, that other entities may make. We have to invest that property, that capital, in property. Um, we can't uh, trade things like that. So it, it's, it's maintaining it as an estate and land. Right, I get that. Can I just pick up on that? Uh, you've referenced there the autonomy that you have from Crown Estate UK, but of course they still hold on to one of the assets in Scotland, Fort Kinnaird. Um, are you aware of any uh, progress in resolving that issue, or is it a dead issue as far as you know? Yeah. It's not something that, that we're, uh, we, we took a front line in negotiating. Uh, it's not something that we're aware of anything, any ongoing discussions about. Because it does seem such an anomaly. OK, let's move on. Um, I, I want to look at the issue of um, the sale of assets. I think we're told that there are plans to sell some of the Crown Estate assets. Could you outline why those are being sold? As, and would that be kind of normal business? Um, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is, but at, uh, at day one, um, we, uh, we started with, with no funds in the bank. Um, and um, in terms of managing the assets, we have to handle revenue and capital separately. If we wish to continue to invest uh, in our estate, which includes uh, investment in agricultural buildings, for example, then we need to raise capital. Um, and you do have the ability to borrow from the Scottish Government, however. So, yes, we do. But a, a decision has uh, been taken that we um, that that we're going to, uh, I guess, raise our own uh, capital. That that's traditionally um, how how the estate has been managed, and that's that's how we're intending on going forward at this point in time. So, so could you outline what assets are planned to be sold? OK, I don't know if Ronnie or Andy wants to take, take that. that. Andy can take it. Yes, as Amanda says, in terms of our sort of business model, uh, the Crown Estate historically and Crown Estate Scotland, um, you know, we, we need to raise the capital from the assets we manage in order to reinvest that capital in property and land to grow the asset value and to generate the revenue that we ultimately <laughs> surrender to government. Um, and that, that hasn't changed following the transfer. We worked very hard uh, in advance of the transfer to put in place a pipeline of sales which would help us to firstly meet our expenditure obligations in the first year of operation uh, and also to start to build up a, a small capital fund to allow us to carry that forward for our ongoing management. And, and historically, that's something, again, that you know, we have disposed of assets in Scotland uh, and it's, it's along a similar sort of scale that we're talking about, although we had to sort of increase that um, in the first year of operation to, to start to build that capital fund. So we've, we're talking about a raising around 10 million in, in asset sales in the first year of operation of Crown Estate Scotland. And that's coming from a, a range of different sales of residential properties uh, that we hold. Uh, a number of farms are in there. Uh, we've got an open market um, sale uh, currently active uh, from the Applegirth Estate. Um, We've also had in capital income coming in from dealings that we did last year, where the income's coming in this year, um, servitude payments for, 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 for um, electricity pylons, for example, and also capital for um, strategic land sales that we negotiated some years ago, and uh, uh, quite substantial income coming in this year from those strategic land sales. So um, the income from capital comes from a wide range of, of, of different transactions, um, and on the coastal side, that could be driven activities around the coastline uh, and from a range of the, the assets on, on the rural estates. The, the other side of that is if we, we have an ongoing um, investment um, programme in, in buildings, uh, putting up new farm sheds, replacing roofs, electrical and asbestos works on residential and other properties, uh, and a whole range of other sort of liabilities that we need to manage from the perspective of, 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 of the estate. So um, what we've put together has been a budget for this year which allows us to manage those uh, liabilities and, and investment uh, requirements while also starting to build a small capital fund to allow us to, to roll that over for next year. Can I just pick up on the, on the point you said there was an 
open market situation with regard to apple girth. Are those farms that were vacant or are they farms that had tenants and if so, are you going to sell to the tenants? The, the particular one um, that I mentioned is a farm that became vacant because the tenant surrendered the tenancy uh, of, uh, of, his, of his own will. Uh, uh, we negotiated a surrender uh, last year. Uh, the decision was then taken that that farm would be put on the open market subject to a, a, a criteria protocol that we developed early on in the new business around farm sales. Um, the open market sales don't happen that frequently within, within the Scottish business. Um, we are all looking at sales to tenants as well as part of the disposals programme. So whether we decide to sell or relet is subject to a, 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 an assessment of the particular unit um, and um, you know, we would work through that assessment. We wouldn't necessarily choose to sell it every time we might want to relet a unit depending on the circumstances, but it is very much uh, around the circumstances uh, at the time. OK, that's good to get that on the record. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Um, if we could turn to a um, specific area of, of the business, and that's aquaculture. Um, so we know that SEPA are introducing a new regulatory framework, this depositional uh, zone regulation, um, and that offers some opportunities for the aquaculture sector, but it also introduces some constraints as well. What, what's your view on that regulation that's been put forward? And how might it impact on uh, on the way that you approach aquaculture? Um, first of all, it's important to recognise we're not the regulator here, um, but that we work closely with Marine Scotland in particular in respect of uh, aquaculture and are working on a number of uh, initiatives, for example, on close containment uh, to see how we can how we can take that further forward. We're, I think we'll, we'll approach that more from the side of helping the developer or helping the, um, the, uh, the fish farmers themselves uh, create be best practice and work within those new, those new structures. So is what you're saying then is that you're effectively there to support the industry rather than steward the resource? Uh, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both, but we're not the marine planner. Right. OK. So uh, I mean, it appears through the new regulation that we could be in a situation where we have expansion of fish farms in uh, more exposed areas, um, but there, isn't, there won't be a requirement um, to regulate fish farms with this new model in more sheltered areas. So what's your, what's your kind of view on that? Do you think that's the right balance or...? I don't, I don't, to be honest, think it's for us to comment on, on that. We will work with the, the regulator to implement and, and make the best of what's there at any given time. So you haven't inputted into the consultation on the regulation at all? We, we've assisted with it, yeah. <coughs> OK. Um, can I move on to another, another issue, convener, and that's um, fishing rights. So I'm picking up quite a lot of frustration amongst a number of organisations, including fisheries trust, uh, fishing trusts, about um, non-native invasive species and some of the challenges around catchment management. Is that something alongside perhaps some of the other catchment issues around flood management, for example, which impacts on your business in terms of fishing rights? Again, in respect of um, fishing uh, and uh, interactions with farm fish, Again, uh, we recognise that that's an issue and uh, we're working with um, SARF and others on the, the likes of, uh, as I said, close containment, uh, particularly for trout, uh, is, is the current project, to see if, if that will help with that issue. I was actually referring to in non-native invasive species. So, for example, giant hogweed at the moment, which is prevalent on, a, on many catchments in Scotland, and there is a concern that there's a lack of joined up action on that. Does that have an impact on your business in terms of the income that you get from fishing rights if people just can't come and fish because it's choked up with hogweed or whatever? I, I think what, what's, to, to be blunt, what's having more of an impact is the, the no take uh, restrictions currently. Um, and, and we're noticing that with the uh, some of the, the local fishing clubs that we've actually halved the rent for last year and this year 
because they're they're noticing a reduction in take up of of local fishing. Okay, so that's a different issue entirely. But coming back to the issue about catchment management and the role that you play within that, what 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 role does the Crown Estate play? So if there's a catchment management plan on giant hogweed or mink or whatever, what what's your role? Is it? Yeah, we, we currently we, we, we work with um, you know, the, the, the relevant authorities. An example being um, the River Spey up in the Falkland Estate, obviously where we've got uh, agricultural or adjoining land to a, to a fishery area. Then obviously we have an interest in in the management of that particular catchment. Um, we've we're actually putting money into non-native species control actually up in that catchment area this year we've identified some funding to go into some uh, control work so we will work with snh and with sepa where there are specific issues uh, and um, where we can assist we we do so what about areas where you've got fishing rights where you've got salmon fishing rights on on rivers um, again that's very much a question of working with the the, the relevant uh, fisheries boards and trusts um, and uh, we will uh, try and coordinate clearly when it comes to aspects of management in riparian areas where we don't have ownership it's it's more challenging for us to to get involved but we will um we will we will certainly work and cooperate with with fisheries boards and um in terms of the management of these areas to what you actually do Um, well, as I said, in, in terms of where we can put money into control mechanisms, then, 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 then where it's appropriate, we do so. Um, in, in terms of when we lease fishery areas to local community groups and, and other angling associations, um, it's a question of um, working with them and the relevant other authorities and adjoining landowners through the fisheries trusts and boards. And, and, and that's a, it may be a question of putting some funding into works to benefit the catchment area um, and whether it's flooding works for example uh, or, or other control measures then um, if it's appropriate we, we will look at that mm -hmm. Carson just, just in the back of that question does the county state apply for the likes of ECAF funding for the control of evasive species and whatever that was a, a grant scheme that would allow organizations to, to invest in removing giant hogweed or, or whatever is that something the Crown Estate would apply for? No, sorry. No. Okay. Can I, can I um, ask you uh, to talk us through the, the issue of offshore renewables? Um, and if we look at the example of the Firth of Forth and Tia Rays, where we, had four, or we have four consented wind farms, could you explain to us, do you have any income stream from those at the moment? Um, and how does it develop from there if they proceed or if they don't proceed? Uh, we don't have any income stream from from those uh, projects at present. Uh, the the way our leases uh, and agreements for lease work uh, for offshore uh, wind farms is we will start to uh, take revenue rent from those projects once they start generating, uh, and given that nothing's built yet, nothing's generating. So there's absolutely nothing uh, coming out of those projects at present. Uh, once um, the court process, if I leave it at that, ha has concluded, uh, it would then be for, uh, there's one project, Nert McGuif, that you're aware has a contract for difference. Already. Glad you can pronounce that. <laughs> Uh, they will uh, then endeavour to reach financial close, uh, and once they've reached financial close, and, and if they reach financial close, uh, then they will approach us for a lease. At that point, uh, we would negotiate the lease, enter into the lease, and that would require them to, to build the project out within a certain time. Normally, can, that would then be consistent with the, the contract for difference as well. Uh, once they started uh, building and generating, we would start getting some revenue in from those, and that would be the same for the other projects, the first out, out of Firth and Forth and Tay, as well, who are consented, but they would then need to apply for the CFD. Mm -hmm. So let's take NNG as a, an example. Um, could you quantify for us what you anticipate the income from that would be? Um, in the past, for um, 
Scottish Territorial Waters projects, STW projects, uh, have given the, the number of uh, £4.6 million per gigawatt installed, uh, and that would still be the same. Over the life of the project? No, that's per annum. Per annum. Um, presumably you project and like that. What impact would it have on the Crown Estate revenues if you weren't to have this sort of income? Uh, you're, you're right. We could project that further forward. However, we don't count on it until until, it, un, uh, until it's there, to be honest, uh, until the, the, the company has reached financial close. Um, and you know, and there's a lot of wind to pass before before that happens. Um, <laughs> Uh, one, once, once we've got to that stage and the breach financial close, then it becomes a real project from our, our mm. side. What does have an impact, uh, therefore, is, is things like the, the capital valuations will increase. Uh, so, for example, uh, you'll see from uh, the numbers uh, for the 16-17 uh, year, uh, the offshore renewables capital valuation actually dropped for the first time. And that's a direct consequence of where we were in the, the court process at that point in time. That valuation was correct at 31st March. At that point, we hadn't had the inner house's decision. Um, so it, it does have a direct impact on our capital valuation at this point in time. I'm looking beyond that that one situation. I mean, presumably offshore renewables is, is a considerable income stream anticipated for the Crown Estate. It is. It's certainly got huge potential, and the team have worked really hard, uh, along with developers, to to bring these projects forward. Uh, and you know, it was great to see uh, the Morpel project in, in the, the Murray Firth get its CFD uh, earlier on this month. Uh, that, along with the Beatrice project, that, along with the. Um, Aberdeen Bay and the Highwind Scotland projects mean that you know Scotland's actually doing very well in offshore wind, and I think that uh, is a testament to the the work that the developers uh, and indeed we, we've put in to make this happen. Uh, but I think that what we have to start doing now is looking to what's going to happen going forward, because it takes you know eight to ten years for these things to come come to fruition. OK, thanks. Can I just move this on a, a little bit as well? Could you outline for us what impact you envisage the forestry bill and Brexit having on the operation of the Crown Estate? I, I mean, at this point in time, I have to declare a bit of an interest because obviously I have a, another role um, with, uh, with the Forestry Commission, so it's probably not uh, best if I uh, comment on, on the forestry bill. So... Um, I'm not. Uh, in terms of the, the, the bill, uh, you know, we, we, we manage some 5,000 hectares of commercial forestry uh, spread across the full rural estates. The bulk of that, that Glenlivet, it's um, a fairly fragmented estate woodlands that are uh, not large scale commercial plantations. Um, we manage those, um, you know, uh, alongside good sound silvicultural practice with forestry stewardship. Council certified um, according to the UK Woodland Assurance Standard, and we're continuing to manage those woodlands uh, in, a, you know, in, in a sustainable way to generate revenue from timber, but also to drive a lot of local benefits for, 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 for tourism, recreation, ex and environment, etc. So, um, you know, I, I see that work continuing. It's very much integrated with other aspects of our estate management. Um, Clearly, um, you know, some, some of the forestry assets uh, we may look at, uh, at, at um, of disposing as part of our sort of to, to raise capital. Um, so that may be something we'll be looking at. Um, and you know, we'll continue to be um, working with other partners to um, maximise the benefits we can from our, our forest management. So we don't see um, things changing significantly as a result of the, the forestry bill. We already work very closely with Forestry Commission Scotland uh, and, and as that evolves and changes, we'll continue to, to work with them uh, in relation to our forest management. As, as regards Brexit, clearly we all know there's a huge amount of uncertainty around around what, what will happen there. Um, you know, from the, from the rural estate perspective, we have some 200 farm tenancies across the estate. That's a, you know, a, a significant proportion of the land in Scotland. Um, that ranges from 
uh, upland agricultural units in, in Glenlivet to some uh, fertile lowland farms at Fockerbers and, and Applegirth. Different sectors of the agricultural um, will, will be hit differently by, by Brexit, and, and there's no doubt that um, you know we, we're, we're going to keep a close eye on how that is impacting on our farmers. We're hoping to run a number of events with our farm tenants uh, to help them to prepare for, for Brexit, working with our managing agents and the expertise that they can bring um, you know, to, to help our, our, our tenants to prepare. But how, how they will be impacted and what impact that will have on our revenues, it's, it's hard to say at this stage. Case. Yes. All right. OK, that's fine. Uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. So you obviously have a, a duty to maintain and enhance the value of um, assets and to return um, any uh, values that are obtained from them. In what sense does um, do those restrictions uh, have a practical impact on how the assets are managed? Is this about the the need to, to maximise revenue that yeah. you're asking about? Um, or to, yes, to, to maintain and enhance the value of yeah. the assets. Um, I, I guess that's what anybody who manages assets is going to be looking to do. Um, is you know you never want to see um, a, a deterioration in the assets, and you and you don't want to see income drop. So, I think just in terms of doing business, you know that's what we would be looking to do anyway. I think what we're in terms of with Crown Estate Scotland uh, now taking on management of the assets, what we are looking to do is to to maximise other benefits um, where possible, and uh, and I think there's actually been some very good examples of where wider public benefits have already been uh, delivered. Um, we've already talked about um, some of the work at Glenlivet and Fockabers, but. Um, one of the first things I did was go to Spay Bay and, and look at, at um, how the organisation is working with Phil Dolphin Conservation Trust at Spay Bay. And I think that's the largest visitor um, attraction um, in Murray um, in terms of footfall. So so obviously that's delivering quite a lot of, of different public, uh, public benefits. But going forward, we are looking at how we can really maximise um, and, and balance up that delivery of of increased revenue with delivery of other public benefits. And we're not the only public agency um, or public organisation to be doing that. And I'm keen to learn from others in terms of how we how we go about that. And um, I've certainly been speaking to Scottish Canals who I think are going through a similar process. So very keen to work with others and to, to, to learn um, from them in terms of, of different ways of doing that. Yeah, I suppose, and I suppose your answer goes right to the heart of, of the question, and because I was going to follow up with how you balance that with other aims around sustainable development, about um, sort of environmental stewardship, because there will be a lot of people with a lo lot of different views of, of what your aims are, and how do you balance that duty to uh, maintain and enhance the value of the asset with, at the same time, um, meeting other aims around the environment, around communities? I, th I mean, obviously, we're working within the framework of the 61 Act at present, so therefore, you know, there is very much an emphasis on the financial aspects, albeit with, uh, you know, taking cognizance of good management, and we're looking to explore that as much as we can um, until any new uh, legislation is in place. But I think this is actually where the opportunities lie um, as far as the assets go in the future. Um, and then, you know, it will depend on what comes out of the legislation. Um, but I think this is where we can have a, a really good debate and discussion about what, uh, where, where that balance lies um, in terms of delivering benefits for, you know, across Scotland. And, and I'm really keen to, to hear about some of that. We are looking at how to measure um, some of the the um, other benefits uh, that we're currently delivering. And I'm going to ask Andy to say a few words about the... Uh, we're, we're doing some work around what's called total contribution, I think it is, so... Yeah, I mean, historically, the Crown Estate has, has been a, a business leader in terms of trying to um, understand um, the sort of broader impacts of running the business, uh, not just the financial benefits that we generate for, for historically Treasury and now uh, Scotland, um, but also the broader environmental and um, social benefits. And we've developed a, a historically a, a programme around total contribution where we look at how we set up a range of metrics to measure that. 
now we've start, now we've transferred to Crown Estate Scotland. We're looking at how we can take that whole piece of work forward. Um, I think very much we've set up an internal steering group to to start to look at that. We hope to sort of develop a set of criteria that we can use as a business driver in terms of trying to inform the investment the committee in terms of where investments might be made in in time. We're also looking at how we can um, incorporate much more more focus on the natural capital agenda. Uh, and we're working currently with um, Scottish Natural Heritage, with SIPA, with Scottish Wildlife Trust, uh, with Scottish Land and Estates, and we're uh, running a, a project um, which is about to start, which is looking at piloting the natural capital protocol at farm and estate level. And the information we get from that will again help to inform and feed into what we're probably we haven't quite decided, but we're moving from the total contribution to total impact as being the sort of um, um, the, the, the way of describing this. But it will really be a, a process which we hope to develop that will identify uh, the, the non-financial benefits of us operating as a business that we can use to, 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 to uh, as, as I said, as a business driver and to inform other decision making. Okay. Yeah. That. Uh, Richard Lyle. Uh, it's been previously, previously asked in the, in the past the performance of uh, Crown Estates. Now we have the new Crown Estates Scotland. Um, what uh, what requirements are placed uh, on you in order to uh, be similar to other public bo bodies? Um, what performance management measures will we put in place and how will this be recorded to ensure transparency? Um, I think the key documents um, are obviously our corporate plan um, and our annual business plans. And th that's what will set out um, what our uh, objectives are within any one year and what uh, KPIs uh, we're going to be working towards. So that's why it's so important that we get uh, feedback uh, through, uh, through consultation on the corporate plan, which is currently out. Um, and, um, and then our, um, our annual... Uh, uh, business plan will uh, well, each annual business plan will obviously then um, will then draw on what what has been set out uh, in the co in in the corporate plan. Um, obviously, I'll I'll hand over to Ronnie to to talk about the development of the business plan and how any targets um, are agreed with our sponsor uh, our sponsor team. Yeah, so we have a we did have a, and continue to have an ongoing discussion with our sponsor unit within Marine Scotland. Um, our framework document that, that's on the website uh, references another 50 documents and policies that, that we should comply with and, and are complying with, and uh, we're, we're taking that further forward. We've also got um, in our business plan, as Amanda says, the uh, reflection of how we're uh, working towards the Parliament, Scottish Government's uh, objectives. So the, there's a number of different different ways of tackling this and um, moving forward with it. Can I say, I, I was impressed in one comment you made a, a few minutes ago that the common sense approach you're having to where fishermen, you, you've actually cut uh, the, the, the cost uh, because of a certain problem. Uh, I know you'll recoup that somewhere else, but uh, can I say I'm impressed at the fact that you you have a, a you're a listening you know you seem to have a, a listening uh, situation within uh, uh, your organisation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Angus McDonald. Um, thanks, can we not? <coughs> excuse me. Just following on from um, Richard Lyle's uh, last comment, there um, the, the committee has previously. He said that it hoped the, the experience, expertise and views of the Crown Estate staff will be actively sought and taken account of in relation to longer term arrangements. Now, uh, I think Ronnie Quinn may have touched on this uh, at the beginning of, of this morning's session, but um, are, are you and your colleagues sufficiently involved in the planning? Um, and can you give an example of how you're engaging with staff to ensure uh, that's the case? Is this in terms of planning for the the longer term planning in terms of the legislation or in terms of the running of the business legislation and the implementation of uh, of the new um, setup okay um I, I'll, I'll hand on uh, to ronnie to supplement whatever i say but in terms of in terms of the legislation um 
as as an organisation, um, it's not appropriate for us um, to have a formal uh, input uh, into that, uh, and we we we, we didn't. Um, the union, uh, which obviously represents a number of staff, um, did um, did have a, an input into that. Um, we are being consulted uh, by Marine Scotland on technical issues um, around uh, the new legislation, because obviously when you're transposing one piece of legislation into another piece of legislation, you need to make sure that everything is covered. And um, all I see is lots of um, emails to Ronnie and very uh, technical uh, details, which uh, I'm quite glad I'm not having uh, to deal with. Um, in terms of the, the running of of the business, um, it's very much a team effort between the board um, and and the staff, and particularly the, the senior team, in terms of shaping the corporate plan. We actually had uh, a session which involved the senior team and the board collectively uh, to make sure that we are actually capturing um, both the. The, the deep knowledge um, of that team, but also bringing a fresh perspective um, in terms of what uh, the assets could be uh, delivering uh, for Scotland as a whole. So I would like to think that we have a very good uh, balance uh, and a very good working relationship between uh, the board um, and, uh, and the staff, um, with us each playing our uh, respective roles. Um, Ronnie. Yeah, to be honest, nothing terribly much to add. Uh, we, we've been giving some uh, fairly arcane, or, or uh, some advice and some fairly arcane points of interpretation uh, on the, the 61 Act. Beyond that, not much else. We are uh, invited along as an observer to Scottish Government Stakeholder Advisory Group on the Crown Estate, but beyond that, that that's about it, to be honest. But Basically, staff at all levels can continue, continually feed in um, any suggestions or ideas that they might have at any point, can they? Well, I'd say, you know, we're not actually being formally engaged on, on the legislation. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I'm in no better position than anyone else in the organisation to, to say what the legislation will say. OK. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Finlay Carson. Thanks, Convener. Uh, you'll be aware that we know not only as a committee look after organisations like yourself, but our, our, one of our remits is, is climate change. Um, can I ask how uh, are you going to deliver as part of your, your duty to the, the, uh, to the, as a public body to Scotland's climate change targets? Andy, are you going <laughs> to? I think it's probably better if Andy takes uh, we, it. We, yeah. we, we have sort of been in, uh, in liaison with, with the Scottish Government Sponsor Department. The Crown of State Scotland is, isn't actually formally obliged uh, under the, the Climate Change Act to, 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 um, to meet the requirements. But, however, we're very keen to, to work within the spirit of that legislation and obviously um, to look at how we can both um, manage our own... Um, emissions, but also how we can mitigate and, 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 and adapt. Um, in, in that respect, the, I mean, the number of ongoing projects like the natural capital work and the total impact, total contribution work, which will ultimately start to look at how we, um, we measure and monitor uh, our, our, our carbon emissions, both in terms of direct activities and being quite a small business and, you know, an, an operation of our offices where we have direct control. Obviously, that's, that's relatively minor impact. The broader impact is actually the activities of our, our partner businesses, our farming tenants, agriculture tenants and, and other businesses over which we don't have direct control. So it's a question then of looking at how we can influence their management activities through facilitation, through knowledge exchange, through uh, other forms of engagement. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we work quite closely with a number of other business, other partners, other agencies. I mean, an example of this would be the work we have continued to do with the Morden Research Institute on, on farm biosecurity and, and, and animal health. Uh, we've continued to fund work that they've been doing on rolling out knowledge exchange to farmers, um, and that has an impact on farm business activity and can influence some uh, emissions as well in relation to livestock management. We've worked with National Park Authority in the Cairngorms over peatland restoration work at Glenlivet. Um, we've helped to facilitate a number of 
biomass installations in farm buildings. Um, so it's a very much a question of us looking at how we can work with our partner businesses uh, and with other agencies in terms of how we can mitigate um, and um, clearly working with our sponsor department as well and look at how we can build that into our... It, it's very much a key objective in the corporate plan uh, to work towards Scotland's low-carbon economy and I think that's something that we're you know, very keen to, 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 to do. So as, as, as we move forward and, and your remit somewhat changes from maintaining and enhancing the value uh, and returning uh, and the return obtained from it more to a less commercial basis uh, and, and including a widening role in, in the social enterprise and also the, the government's objectives. Do you see yourself working towards reporting under uh, uh, the, the climate change reporting framework in the future? Uh, the, well, who's having the discussion? Ha there's discussions happening in the Scottish Government about exactly what um, what we will be doing going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a meeting set up next month. Right. So I think after that, we'll be in a better position to know what we should be doing. Okay. okay. Good. Mark Roscoe. Um, I was <coughs> going to ask a similar question, but I'll take it to the next step. Um, there's also a biodiversity duty on, on public bodies as well. So do you intend to report on that? So. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, we, we, we reported on that in, uh, in a historically in, in, in previous Scotland reports. Um, we are currently reviewing, again, having done the transfer, moved into the new body, we're reviewing all our biodiversity action plans for the, for the rural estates uh, and, and starting to look at how we then um, incorporate that into uh, future business planning. Um, and we have a range of uh, projects ongoing across uh, across various properties um, which are helping to enhance biodiversity again working in partnership with other key agencies and examples quite substantial examples at Glenlivet where we've worked with the Scottish Wildcat project for example the National Park albeit that that area of Glenlivet has now been taken out of that due to a lack of wild Scottish wildcats in the area. But um, we've done work on, on water voles. Uh, we've got a community group up there doing a lot of local wildlife recording. So it's it's something that, yeah, we, we will continue to report on. So th those relate to assets where you have direct control. Mm -hmm. But we raised earlier the point about assets where you're effectively the landlord and you're working with industry within a regulator, so aquaculture. Would you see your interpretation of your biodiversity duty extending to that as well? No, at present, under, the, under our Act, we have to invest in land uh, and in our land, and, and that, that's, that's where it is. OK, so to go back to the other example I used about non-native invasive species, there is an interaction there with the fishing rights that you lease out to the trusts. But your role really stops there because you're just issuing the fishing rights. You're not you're not concerned with wider catchment issues where you don't have a direct asset. That that that's the way it is under the Act. We will invest uh, in in property and in land, and uh, that that that's where that that varies ends. We can invest to enable um, investment on our property and in our land, uh, but we have to be careful how we, how we do that. So is that a constraint, then, that you don't feel able to get into wider areas of <coughs> leadership and cooperation? I think, I think we just have to recognise the, the scale and the size of Crown Estate Scotland, uh, its remit, remit to, uh, under the 61 Act that, that we're still working under to uh, to grow and enhance the estate. We have uh, restrictions on our use of capital. Uh, we have to, have to be careful how we do that, but it has to be related to our estate. Okay. Just picking up on that point, you, you've referenced restrictions you're working to, and yet earlier you said that you had no role in seeking to influence the legislation that will provide a framework for your operation going forward. Surely it would be appropriate for you to have some degree of conversation as an organisation pointing out to government where you think you could take on other duties, where you could operate slightly differently in, in, in the greater interest? I, I think th what we've been doing is we've been responding to questions as they've been asked to us. So we've not been proactively lobbying um, 
you know, in terms of what, what we think should be in the new legislation, because that wouldn't be appropriate. But when we have been asked specific questions, then we have responded uh, to them. Okay, that's useful to, okay. to clarify that. Any members have further questions? No? Okay, well, I think we've covered a wide uh, sort of range of questions this morning. That has been very useful. Can I thank all of you for your attendance today? I uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the third item on the agenda today is for the committee to initially consider petition PE01636 by Michael Trail, which calls upon the Scottish Parliament to require that all single-use cups are 100% biodegradable. The committee clearly uh, has a range of options available for its consideration. I refer members to the uh, paper and I invite any comments that members might have. Emma Harper. Quite timely, actually, because we spoke about this last week when various questions were, I guess, brought up about what Parliament is actually doing to have us reduce our disposable cup usage as well. OK. But uh, specific thoughts on the best way forward at this stage? Can, can I suggest we keep the petition open and write to the Scottish Government? Okay. And, uh, uh, work out what uh, work they're going to look at as part of their wider work on waste. OK. And perhaps invite some indication of, of time frames that they're working to as well? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is that agreed? That's the approach we'll take? We're agreed? OK. Uh, I therefore uh, close the formal part of the, the public part of the meeting. Um, yeah, uh, it's next meeting on the 3rd of October. The committee will take evidence from the Scottish Land Commission. The committee will also review its consider consideration of petition PE01615 on the state regulated licensing system for game bird hunting and consider subordinate legislation on water supplies. As agreed earlier, we'll now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.